from the Paris of the Midwest, welcome to your Daily Detroit. It is Wednesday, December 14th, 2022. I'm Jer Stays, and across the table from me is... Cheyenne Serini. It is so good to see you. It's been a minute. It has been a minute. It's great to see you, too. Yeah, we've got a lot to talk about. The rundown is big, Cheyenne. There's big towing changes in the city of Detroit that impact residents and visitors. Because this is going to be a big deal. Macomb County officials are disappointed about some zoo developments that are not happening. A casino downtown is working with Amazon and getting a cashless market. Hopcat revealed more details about their upcoming downtown Royal Oak space. And we discuss Aretha Franklin's mansion is back on the market. Are you in or are you out? So let's get started. First up, I think the most, I guess, hard news of the episode is that Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan, along with Police Chief James White, announced some major towing reforms. Now, listeners will know, especially Detroit residents will know, that if your car gets towed in years past, and it's been worse in the last 10 years or so, if your car gets towed, bad things can happen very quickly. Like, this can spiral out of control. And and towed, even if it's towed and stored and your car got stolen, yeah, things can go a little sideways. Yeah. It's been a mess for a long time. And it's been a root of a lot of the corruption. It has been. Yeah. And, and part of the reason has been is that the towing contracts have not been through City of Detroit processes, but they were awarded by permit through the Police Board of Commissioners. That has changed. And there is a lot of reforms that were announced on Tuesday. There were seven companies that were awarded contracts. Now the city says that it's going to be taking a much larger percentage of the tows themselves. So over the last few years, you know, since those issues, right, we've had council members literally go. We've had, I think, eight officers get in trouble, a deputy police chief get in trouble Mm -hmm. because there's just a huge pot of money. And if there's a big pot of money around government and there aren't controls, you know what people try to do? They try to take all that money. Yes, they do. Right. They take it for themselves. And so up till now, within recent years, the city of uh, Detroit's been taking about a quarter of the tow rotation. Now they're going to take 35 to 40 percent of it, which will reduce fees. Now, here's the other big thing. If your car is stolen in the city of Detroit, and I have had friends go through this pain, they will waive the storage fees if you do not have theft insurance on your car. And I have had friends who have paid hundreds of dollars after their car was stolen, and they're really excited that their car's back, and then they have to spend hundreds of dollars or $1,000 to get it out of the yard. And that is, has been just a really like difficult thing. Yeah. There's just been towing issues for years. This has been a mess in the city. I feel like if your car is stolen... You've already gone through a traumatic experience and then them being like, oh, yeah, we found your car. And then you go to the tow yard and they're like, oh, but the only way you can get it out is if you pay us a thousand dollars or whatever it was or it whatever was $1, it was in that case. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know? that was the day they moved out of the city of Detroit. Yeah. This is a big deal, I think, for residents and also for visitors. You come in, something bad happens. Things like that do happen. Mm hmm. You don't want to be able to go through that. And I'm also glad that this is an opportunity that hopefully these reforms help get rid of some of these issues. Now, there are other reforms with this that are tied to it, including software to assign the toes out. Because one of the problems in the past is, is that a police officer would just get a buddy, Mm -hmm. you know, that's on the permit list and throw that money over there. There's just been a lot of issues with this. And now there will be software to do it. You will be able to actually track the status of the vehicle, the condition of it. In fact, this will be on a public website, which is very important. That is a big deal. Like, because it can be a black box. You can call and it'll be like hours. Like, you can't get a response from somebody. And having that all digitally just makes sense. Like, this is something that people, like, once it's scanned through the system, like, people shouldn't have to touch this. Yeah. You know, Jer, we've known each other a very long time. And I know you remember my old car, Blue. And what was Blue? Blue was a 1978 Grand Le Mans. <laughs> <laughs> it was a four door, it was the only year where the back windows did not roll down. So it was almost like you were in a police car, but you weren't (laughs) really in a police car. But it had so many like problems with the transmission that I am just really glad it never broke down and had to be towed to like the yard. Actually, I remember one time you were on East Jefferson and you were like, (laughs) get the tow truck here so the city doesn't pick it up. Yeah, it was always an adventure in that car. (laughs) Hey, 
Jared, do you remember a couple years ago when we got into another car, a newer car, and drove all You the- mean the Le Mans still doesn't <laughs> exist? <laughs> it, well, it no longer exists. My sister took the car, and I think what happened was her car was in the shop, and she couldn't pay for it, her services or whatever. So she gave them my car as like, here, take my car <laughs> and use it for parts. Wow. I mean, I was up at school, so I didn't need it anymore. I couldn't take it to school with me. And you but- still love your sister? Yes, I still okay. love her. Okay. But anyway, I, I do miss Blue. She was, a, it was a really good car, even though I had problems. Anyway, remember when we went to Mount Clemens to go to this press conference? It was on Punchki Day. Oh, yeah. And Mark Hackle was there and all the people from the Detroit Zoo were there. And they were there to announce this big, awesome nature center. Was it going to be like 10 million bucks or something like that? Yeah. It was I remember be- the Punchkis too. Like, Mark yeah. Hackle handed me a punch key and made eye contact. Because it was, was like, at 8.30 in the morning or something. It was super early in the morning, I remember. And mm-hmm. we had to drive all the way to Mount Clemens. And it was a good punch key. It was a good punch key. And, uh, but they, they gave us punch keys. So I'll drive for punch key. That was not the reason we covered the story. That was not story. the reason we covered the story. We did we, not know we were getting them coming in. <laughs> no, we didn't. It was a nice surprise. Anyway, we were supposed to get this beautiful nature center on Lake St. Clair in, I think, Harrison Township. They were looking for spots, and I think they were going for Harrison Township. I had forgotten about this one. Like, I remember the punch key, but I had forgotten what it was for because it was so... We've done so many of these over the years. Also, this was in 2018, Jer. I went and looked it up, and we did a story on the podcast in 2018, way back in the day, when we used to play the Detroit People Mover sound. Oh, wow. I learned that that was big on (laughs) Grinder. I learned that this week. <laughs> we should play it again. Anyway, that project is is no longer happening. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. So that was what I was seeing coming through my inbox when yeah. Hackle had his Mark Hackle. He is the uh, head of Macomb County. County executive, people don't know. He had his Hackles up. If you will. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, that deal and that whole big project is no longer happening because mainly the pandemic Okay, so how did the pandemic affect this one? Because this is one where I remember as getting the funding for the zoo and all that stuff, the regional funding, there's a really big push to try to get more outposts in more counties. Yes. So the issue is pretty much twofold right now. So the financial issues are pretty big, right? Like we had a 57% drop in 2020 from the previous year in the zoo's earned Revenue. So like that's income from like like parking and, and admissions. Like admissions, all that stuff. Yeah. So that's less money that they got in. This is according to a report in the free, free press. press, right? Yes. Okay. And then the total revenue, which included grants and philanthropic gifts, dropped from forty three million dollars to twenty eight million dollars over the same year to year span. Oof. So that's a big deal. And then what's the second part of this? So the second part of this is the actual cost for the Nature Center and what it would actually have been. They were originally saying it was going to be about $10 million. I remember this. And then it kind of went up to $20 million. And then at some point it went up to like $30 million. Well, everything is more expensive now, but wow. Yeah. I mean, and I understand that they really wanted to make this thing like really great. So it could be a destination for the region. Now, the philanthropic community has changed a lot about what they give to and how they give in recent years. Did that impact things? Yeah, that was a big deal. Philanthropic charities have changed their priorities, especially since the pandemic happened. Mm. So going into this, in my mind, I have known the attendance at the zoo to be like, oh, I know more than a million. I think 1.4-ish million, depending on the year. That's what I know the zoo to have. So- How did the pandemic hit them and how have they come back at all? So with the pandemic, it dropped to 61% in 2020. So of that number? Of that number. 61%. That's kind of understandable. Although, on the other hand, they're an outdoor venue. So maybe they fared better than some other places. They might have. But they were also like limiting the amount of attendees throughout the day. They had timed attendance. They shut down a lot of their buildings. And that's something you know because you're a member, right? You've been a member for years. Yeah. That has affected things. Now, attendance is up this year. So right now it's at around 960,000 visitors. And that's according. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, it is up from like 2020, but it's still nowhere near it was before the pandemic. So this makes me think that uh, 
there are a number of things that may have to rescale over the years. Like I remember hearing about the Michigan Science Center who changed their plans. Yeah. That remember when RoboCop was supposed to be at the Science Center? I do. I remember that. And now it's going to be an Easter market. But that was going to be part of a bigger redo of yeah. all of that area. In fact, I was walking past the Midtown offices and I saw in their window a model of remember that loop plan? Yeah. That was supposed to redo all that stuff around Midtown and in fact even considered for a minute like – reducing traffic on Woodward and lots more green spaces. And we haven't heard much of any of that stuff lately. Yeah. And I mean, understandably, I think this is part of the change that we're seeing is that I think there has been ongoing impacts. And if the zoo, which is an out, mostly outdoor thing, hasn't seen a return. And I've talked off the record to a number of business owners where they're seeing casuals return, but they're not seeing the same amount of uh, event traffic yeah. of gatherings that they were. And then here's the other thing. I was listening to a show in Chicago for another thing I'm researching. Their traffic for locals hasn't rebounded either. So this isn't a Detroit thing. Like there are multiple cities now that the uh, arts and culture traffic hasn't yeah. come back. So I'm really curious, like these effects, it's like not everybody, but maybe it's enough to really make things really shaky for yes. some organizations. Yeah. I agree. You might be wondering, so what's the plan now? Yes. Now that this nature center is no longer going to be a thing. In a press release from the Detroit Zoo, they said that they are partnering with Metro Parks to create outdoor education. They're still currently like figuring out what that's going to be. So, I mean, there was. So it, was it was it one of those general releases? Yeah, it was, just it was like, like a, not very big on specifics, but we're thinking about doing this. Yeah. Like okay. this is the plan. But we haven't figured out all the details yet. You know, if you have changed your habits, dailydetroit at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. So, Cheyenne, this one I wanted to follow up on from uh, the inbox because we have had this discussion about cashiers yes. on and off on this show. And uh, we learned... First off, that you are in the minority position I am. about having cashiers for checkout for markets and things. When we did this episode and you were like, hey, cashiers, we did a poll and it was insane. Like you were in the <laughs> super duper minority, like the one out of five. I know. I am. That was like pro cashiers, your line, like people wanted the cashier list because on social media, sometimes you'll see it be different. This one isn't just cashier list. There's this new market that's coming together that is cashless and it's the first in the city of Detroit working with Amazon. What do you know? This is actually going to be at the Greektown Hollywood Casino. Oh, that's right. It's a Hollywood casino now. It is a but Hollywood. But every time I hear Hollywood, I think about Paul Hollywood. Like I think <laughs> baked goods. I know it's supposed to be Hollywood, like LA. Yeah. But I'm my head's great British breaking show. Yeah. I don't know what I think about when I think of Hollywood, but I don't think Greektown Casino. But Inside where they serve the food and everything, there's a little 400 square foot market in there. And they're actually working with Amazon and having a cash list where you can like sign up for Amazon One and you can wave your palm and it'll scan your palm and you can go through the gate and then you can go and shop and then you can leave. So it's a whole different kind of palm reader in Greek town. <laughs> remember the one who told me I was going to be mayor one day? I do remember that. This was in 1999, friends. <laughs> Anyway, so, yeah. so what are your thoughts on this? I don't know. Maybe I've just watched too many dystopian movies, but I feel like it's a slippery slope. I don't know. Like I can just like vision like not necessarily barcodes. Like I'm not going like Hobby Lobby over here where they're anti-barcode. So I have a really hard time with cashless places because cash is legal tender and if you don't allow people to use dollar bills or coins, you're like limiting a group of people who might not have debit cards or credit cards. I think about that less when it comes to the casino. I mean, and that's the thing. Like, OK, it's a casino. You don't necessarily want to have cash on you all the time. But anyway, I have a problem with it. I feel weird about it. You can use your debit card or credit card to get in. You don't have to use your palm. So or the Amazon One or, or whatever. Or the Amazon One. You don't have to use the Amazon One if that freaks you out. Or you don't have it. Or you don't. You can sign up for it, though. Yeah, of course they'll want you to sign up for it. Yeah. So there are a number of Amazon markets that are on the board to be built in the suburbs. Yep. Talked a little bit about that on some previous shows. 
I don't know. I feel like this is the future. Like there's no way we're going back. And I think we're doubling down after the pandemic because of the staffing shortages. Like I hear you, but whether it's from our inbox or like my personal experience, I feel like this is, this is the future, whether we want it or not. I will say that they will have a store attendee who can help you with things who's working there. So there is like one person in the store to help you if you have a problem, but they're not going to check you out. Well, one thing that's interesting about some of the Amazon prototype stores in other cities, and I don't know about this place, but in those prototype stores, you pick stuff off the shelf. And as you go through, it knows everything you bought. Oh, yeah. There's cameras down each aisle with sensors. And according to what I read, there's no facial recognition. They basically said like you're like just like a black line moving through the store. And you can pick stuff up and you can put stuff down. You won't be charged for the stuff that you put down. I know it's the wave of the future. And I understand that. And I know change is hard. And I'm trying to like go with the flow. But also, I don't know how I feel about it. So are you going with the flow or are you on Team Cheyenne? DailyDetroit <laughs> at gmail.com. This next one is a bar opening. We know listeners love to hear about them. Now, this is new with an asterisk, yes. right? Because Hopcat had a space in Royal Oak for a while, that three-level thing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Hopcat is back, and they have taken over a gigantic space on Main Street between 4th and 5th, which is just, like, huge. So, according to the company, they've taken over the former Noodles & Company GameStop and BD Mongolian Barbecue, RIP BD Mongolian oh, Barbecue. But that's a, a big spot. That's more huge. than 11,000 square feet. A separate report from the Detroit News says that, and I'll link to it in the show notes, that there will be more than 250 bar seats, seats at the bar alone. How is that possible? I mean, this is going to be like the meeting place, right? So I feel like they're looking across the street because this is right across the street from the Buffalo Wild Wings that used to be the Barnes & Noble. Yes. Rest in peace, old Barnes & Noble. (laughs) Our elder millennial is showing, (laughs) Cheyenne. I know it is. So I feel like they're like looking at, because that's a pretty large Buffalo Wild Wings across the street. And I feel like they're being like, I'm going to trump you. It adds to the destination because I feel like there's an overlap in those customers. Mm -hmm. And people like multiple stops. And that's one thing that downtown Royal Oak is doing pretty well. It is. Is setting up where you can hop to one place to the other to the other and make an evening of it in that area. And it's walkable. Yeah, it's all walkable. But uh, I just thought it was interesting to mention. I go on occasion. I go if I get a gift card. Really? Okay. Strong feels. Good for them for reopening in Royal Oak. All right, finally, and this we talked a little bit about on Facebook last week, but I wanted to bring it up with you, Cheyenne, because you and I both love music and Motown music, and we also love old houses. We do. And this is like a half mile from our old University District third floor that we used to record the show on, so I just had to bring it up. Aretha Franklin's old Detroit mansion is back on the market for less than a million dollars, 975000 It has not been occupied for a long time. And this new listing doesn't have interior photos. I remember the interior photos from back in the day. They say that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. It's in a really, I think, great location, being like Seven Mile and Pontchartrain, near like the golf club and Palmer Park. Like, it's a great neighborhood over there. It's a beautiful neighborhood. However... This is a house with some history. It's uh, 5,600 square feet, and we're looking at four and a half bathrooms from 1927. Now, obviously, this is going to be a beast of a project. A, do you think it's worth 975? And B, would you take it on if you had the money? And C, do you think it comes with a ghost? (laughs) C, definitely. (laughs) I get some vibes. I do love that area as well. If I had unlimited funds, I would take it on if I had unlimited funds, because why not? Uh, But I don't have unlimited funds, and that's way out of my price range right now. I feel like the buyer of this house is somebody who, like, this isn't a situation where you're going to flip it and make money. This is a situation where, because in order to flip it and make money, the price has to go way down. Yeah. Way, way down. I think this is one where somebody buys it who they just want to have it. 
Yeah. I think about when the Motown Mansion was up for sale. Mm -hmm. That's something you don't buy to flip because, or to to turn it around in a few years. That's something where it's like, oh, I want to be the person who owns Aretha Franklin's old mansion and I love it and I love the lines of it and I'm just going to do it. And I feel like with the renovations that need to be done, you would definitely get the house that you want because I don't think she's moving ready yet. I do want to point out, though, that like right after Aretha Franklin died, the estate sold the last property for $300,000. Oh, because I remember that was a time, but I didn't know it was 300 k Yeah. So I saw that in the Detroit News. Cranes linked to that old story. And I was like, 300000 And they want nine. That's, I mean, I understand inflation, but. That's a lot of money to be. You got to show me that you've done some work in yeah, between like, there. If it is turnkey, moving ready with historically accurate stuff, I don't want no white walls and gray paint. Beige? No grayish? No grayish. No beige. No shiplap. This is a 1927 house. I could see asking for that price. But if it's like you still have to do work on it, mm-mm. We don't want a Betty White situation necessarily. We do not want that. For people who don't know, somebody bought Betty White's house and then tore it down. I'm very upset about it. All right. Thank you so much for listening to Your Daily Detroit. I hope you enjoyed our little show today. Cheyenne Nosarini, always so good lad to see you. It is always so much fun to come on the show. It is. It is. And not just be editing it. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> As always, if you'd like to support what we're doing, patreon.com slash daily Detroit. Feedback daily Detroit at gmail.com. And I mean, I feel like I have to say this. Smash that follow button. Is that what the YouTubers <laughs> do? Tell a friend and smash the follow button or smash the like button. Smash. There aren't buttons in podcasting. There aren't. Just, yeah. Just follow along. Listen next time, please. Just listen. All right. With that, I'm Jer Stays. And I'm Cheyenne Nosarini. Remember that you are somebody, and we'll see you around Detroit. <laughs>